welcome everybody. I'm happy to welcome you to our final business breakfast of the spring. And uh, I hope you all received your friend's solicitation letter in the mail to renew your membership. Your membership gift is really important to these programs. It enables us to provide the business breakfast. So I hope you'll renew your membership. And if you're not a friend, I hope you'll become one. I'm delighted to welcome Elizabeth von Hotspur, our neighbor and friend to Brasville this morning. She is managing director of Winston Art Group, the nation's leading independent art appraisal and advisory firm, specializing in confidential and objective appraisal services and advice on the acquisition or disposal of all fine and decorative art, jewelry, and collectibles. A graduate of Stanford University, she received her master's degree in international relations from Columbia University. Elizabeth began her career as assistant vice president in charge of the appraisal department at Christie's New York. She then served as vice president and director of the estates and appraisal department of Habsburg Fine Art Auctioneers. From there, she went on to become president of U.S. operations for estate advisory services before joining the Winston Art Group. She currently serves on the board of the Appraisers Association of America. She is chair of the Appraisal Foundation, a fellow of the Pierpont Morgan Library and the Royal Institute of Char Chartered Surveyors. She's a member of the Art Table and the Advisory Committee of the Museum of Art and Design. She is a qualified expert witness and a frequent lecturer on fine and decorative arts and has contributed chapters to several fine art publications. Elizabeth has built an impressive career as a guardian of art, protecting its integrity and defending against imitation, forgery, and fraud. Henry James wrote, art makes life, makes interest, makes importance. And this morning, Elizabeth will share how art <coughs> makes an important and interesting asset worth protecting. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you, Ellen. It's funny, you know, people said to me, are you nervous? And normally I do so many of these lectures every year, I never get nervous except my sisters in the audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, the other interesting thing is, you know, I, I studied, everyone asks me if I studied uh, art history. I didn't. I studied international relations uh, with a concentration in arms control and disarmament. So, <laughs> figure out how that helps in my career. In any case, I just wanted to start out with a kind of overview of the art market because it's, uh, it's interesting these days. It's a $65 billion a year uh, industry, something that we never saw. You know, 10 years ago, it was a fraction of that. Uh, last year in November, there was an auction at Christie's and Sotheby's. Every November, there are auctions of uh, either uh, Impressionist and Modern and the next week Contemporary. The contemporary sales last November reached $1.1 billion. That's an extraordinary number if you consider that happened over the course of four hours and about 140 lots of, of artwork. So this is a market that is just exploding. You can see there on the upper left, the Francis Bacon made a world record price last November of $142 million. First time a contemporary uh, work of art has exceeded a uh, modern and impressionist work of art, although there was uh, last year a private sale of a Cezanne for $250 million. So again, a, a crazy market. And I put up there a quote for those of you, I don't know, the, uh, Bronxville so full of uh, finance types. I put a little quote from Oscar Wilde that said, when bankers get together they discuss art, and when artists get together they discuss money. <laughs> so. The Wall Street Journal also, as you see, some of you may have read this, the Wall Street Journal said that the art market is the largest legal economy to be largely unregulated. That gives us all a lot of opportunities and it creates a lot of issues. Let me just give you a, um, a little more uh, in-depth um, insight into what's happening in the art market. The art market is not just modern and impressionist and contemporary art. It's also jewelry, it's all kinds of different um, areas of the market, which I'll talk about a little bit. But you see here that it's not just the contemporary and, and modern uh, areas of the market that have increased so much uh, in the last couple of years. Diamonds have, gone, have doubled since 2000, uh, since 2000, between 2000 and 2013. And they continue to increase, at, again, at an exponential rate. And look at the number, the, the, the names on the right-hand side there. It used to be that the, the greatest artists, the artists that sold the, the most, were all Western artists. Now, 
three out of the top five artists in 2011 were Chinese contemporary artists in terms of turnover at auction. The market is broadening and deepening. As I said, it's not just modern and contemporary art that, that is uh, making a lot of news. Look at the different areas of the market that have increased uh, greatly over the past couple of years. Two of them being what are thought of sort of as, as men's collectibles, wine and watches. Those two areas of the market are huge now. You can see that that uh, case of Screaming Eagle bought $500,000 at auction. That Patek brought over $2 million at auction. But also, I mentioned the jewelry. Look at that, that price for a, a pink diamond, $82 million. It's extraordinary. Some of the lesser known collectible areas that are exploding are coins. Everybody, we talk to a lot of people and, and many of them say, I don't collect. But then when you ask them, do you have a stamp collection? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have some coins? Mm -hmm. Watches, all those things that people don't normally think of as collectibles. They're <laughs> really exploding on the market. So coins, stamps, you can see there, Chinese um, imperial porcelain. It's being repatriated by the Chinese and 20th century decorative art. So 20th century, mid-century mid modern furniture, like the one you see there, the Carlo Molino. What an extraordinary price for a piece of, of furniture. With this uh, exploding uh, of the market comes some more regulation. Although it's not a regulated industry, the IRS now re relies on the Appraisal Foundation in Washington who created what's called the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, otherwise known as USPAP. Not a very beautiful acronym, but everybody in that world knows about USPAP. The IRS requires that appraisers now be compliant with USPAP, which means that they follow certain standards when they're preparing appraisals. This never happened before. Ten years ago, nobody did. You'd see appraisals that were one line with a value, nothing else, no backup, no photographs, no description. That you have to do that now or the appraisal can be disqualified. Uh, appraisers have to be what the IRS considers qualified appraisers, which means that they have enough education and knowledge in their particular area of expertise that the IRS um, deems them to be appropriate appraisers. If they're not, the appraisal can be disqualified. So if you're giving something, if you're donating something to a museum, or you are uh, having an estate tax appraisal prepared, if the IRS deems that your appraiser is not a qualified appraiser, you can have that appraisal thrown out, the donation can be disqualified, <coughs> and you can be in for months and months of, of issues with the IRS. <coughs> One of the other issues we come across all the time is level of value. There are, in fact, uh, two, if not more, levels of value that are used in the art market. You'll see, if you look at your insurance documents, your, your insurance appraisals, it mostly says market value. That's a concept that doesn't exist in the art market. So you should beware because if something happens to one of your works of art uh, and it's scheduled on your appraisal, your appraisal, your, on your uh, insurance listing, it might say you will be compensated at market value. What's market value? Well. The, IRA, the uh, insurance company might say that market value is fair market value. Fair market value is what the things would bring at auction, basically. Uh, and you can see on this slide, I, I'm illustrating what fair market value is versus retail replacement value. Uh, fair market value, as I said, was what you would expect to get for something at auction. So on the left, you said Elsa Peretti Cuff, which brought $3,200 at auction. But to replace it at Tiffany's, you'd spend over $12,000. So $12,000 would be the retail replacement value, what you would expect to have to pay if you needed to replace it with something of like kind in, in, a, at a, in a dealer setting. And fair market value would be what you'd get if you were to sell it at auction. Two very different levels of value. Same thing on the right-hand side, you see that Ralph Lauren desk. At Ralph Lauren, it's gonna cost you, what is that, $7,800? But a similar one sold at auction uh, in 2013 for $600, a huge differential. So it's, a, it's really important to know that difference between fair market value and retail replacement value. However, there are always exceptions to every rule. Uh, rare works of art, there's that, that uh, Francis Bacon that I mentioned before. 
it brought $142 million at auction. <coughs> Excuse me. That is absolutely so far above what you would expect a retail value to be. So there you have a fair market value, an auction value, being above retail for extraordinary works of art that happens all the time, for celebrity auctions. That uh, Andy Warhol, Liz Taylor, is a perfect example. That normally retails for, what is that, sixty to $95,000. Look at the price it brought at the Elizabeth Taylor auction at Christie's, over $660,000. So again, celebrity auctions turn those value levels completely on their head. And finally, on the right-hand side, you see volatile markets, like the Chinese um, um, porcelain market. If you come across something extraordinarily rare, the Chinese will jump at it and that price will be driven far above what it would cost normally to uh, find something like that at a dealer's. We had recently a group of late 19th century, early 20th century jades, not very interesting. There were about uh, 25 of them. We went to sell, we had to sell them on behalf of an estate. They had in fact donated them to the Met and the Met turned them down, so they had to be sold. Uh, they were estimated by, first of all, they were turned down by Christie's, Sotheby's, and Bonhams. We went to an online auction house run by an ex-Sotheby's person called Lark Mason, uh, who said eighty to 120000 for the group. They made over a million dollars. These are late 19th century, early 20th century jades, the kind you'd find every day on the market in China or in Hong Kong. But you have that Chinese incredible drive to repatriate works of art. Uh, that they see of interest that are made in China and the price soared. So again, these le price levels are, are easy to define and, and very hard to really pin down. What else has to happen now these days? The, the current appraisals have to be compliant with USPAP. They also have to have a lot more detail in them than ever before. You need a color digital image. This is what IRS requires, color digital image. You need a backup of each value. So you can see on the right-hand side that the values are backed up by comparables in the auction market or in the retail market, depending on the level of the value of the uh, appraisal. Uh, you need to put in condition, exhibition history, provenance, uh, literature citations, all of that, again, unheard of 10 or 15 years ago. It's a whole new ball game. Expertise has never been more important. I give you this example here of two paintings that were sold two lots apart at a Sotheby's sale a few years ago. They're by the same artist, same medium, same subject. Why would one bring 240 and the other 42,000? The person who bought the $42,000 one probably thought, oh, I'm getting such a great deal. No, because an art, for this artist, people who collect this artist, they want crashing waves and not calm seas. Oh. Who would know that unless you were an expert? So we, it is all the more important that clients who are buying now get good objective expertise so that they can buy the best thing they can for the money they have available. We had another situation actually with a, uh, um, a client who called me, he was walking down the street in London. There were two paintings in uh, a gallery in London. One was a Van Dong and the other Pissarro and they were asking $6 million for them. A few clicks on the online uh, database Artnet showed that six months earlier he, the, the dealer had bought them for two million dollars. So I told him to ask, uh, to, to give the guy 10% over the two million and he got them for, for that amount. <laughs> Frequency of appraisals. We know it used to be that people would say, insurance companies and, and people in the in industry would say, every three to five years. That's, that's plenty of time to do an appraisal. Now we're doing our contemporary collections every six months because as the market changes, you know, there are two auction seasons. There's May in New York, June in London, and, and November in um, New York, December in London. So each time one of those major sales happens, the market shifts, contemporary particularly. So we are updating our, our clients' collections every six months. Our fine art team appraised last year over eight billion dollars of art and it's 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 a, a huge industry and, and of that probably 90 percent was contemporary and modern and the rest were the other categories i talked about before so frequency of appraisals contemporary every six months modern six months to a year 
uh, American paintings, they, they took a big dip in 2008, but they've climbed right back up again, so we're doing those every year. Uh, jewelry every year. English furniture, sadly, every five years. That market hasn't changed at all over the past five years. Uh, English silver, same thing. Um, the sales are pretty weak in that, those areas right now. But within each of those categories, not everything has to be done every year. And it's interesting to note there are various programs out there that uh, the insurance companies use and, and other people use that, that use index linking for increasing the value in different areas. Index, index linking doesn't work because as you can see here, each work of art goes up at a different rate. So you need to have someone look at the, your collection and look at them as individual works of art and change them as appropriate. So you can see here three different examples of three Western uh, American paintings all increasing in value at a different rate. Provenance is a, a key factor in the art market now. You can see the, the Tang horse on the right with no provenance whatsoever is unsaleable. Whereas the, pro, the, the Tang horse on the left hand side that has a wonderful provenance uh, sold in, in 2011 for 158000 and recently for over a million dollars. Great piece, great provenance, fantastic price. How did something not have a pro? I mean, it came from somewhere. But it yeah, it probably came, it was probably dug out of China and uh, smuggled into Hong Kong and then taken by a dealer to the U.S. No provenance. Authenticity is a huge issue now in the market. You've, you've probably read, and I'll talk about later, the Nodler case, but uh, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Uh, this beautiful Andy Warhol that was own, owned by a man called Joe Simon Whalen, he bought it from one of Warhol's staff back in the 70s, I believe, and turned around and tried to sell it a couple of years ago. It was uh, sent to the Andy Warhol Foundation, which didn't exist when he purchased it, the Andy Warhol Foundation turned it down and said it was a forgery. He sued, and after millions and millions and millions of dollars, he was bankrupt, and the Andy Warhol Foundation decided to shut down their expertise because they were spending so much time and so much money on lawsuits with people who didn't agree with their findings. Um, hugely important that when you buy something or when you know someone who buys something, that they make sure that the work is authentic before they put the money down to buy it. Uh, the, in this case, he should have kept better, becker, better records uh, as to who sold it to him and the circumstances under which it was sold and should have gotten some kind of a letter from Andy Warhol saying it was authentic. Uh, he's still hanging on to it, but it's, uh, he, as I say, he's bankrupt now and, and can't do anything more to prove his case. On the right-hand side, another issue with the Dan Flavin that we see a lot now is that it's not really the work of art that has any value, it's the certificate. This Dan Flavin uh, piece comes with a certificate. If the certificate is lost, the foundation will not replace it. So if the certificate is lost, the, work of val the, the piece has no value whatsoever. If he had the certificate, the owner of this, and the light bulb burnt out or the piece broke, he could get it remade with the certificate. So uh, not only Dan Flavin, but artists like Saul LeWitt, if you lose your certificate, they become worthless. Uh, even artists, uh, e there, there are many artists like this uh, where we've seen collectors who, when someone in their family has died, they'll clear out the safe deposit box, they'll throw away all the papers, and the work of art becomes worthless. Uh, with jewelry also, it's very important to get certificates from the GIA or from another recognized uh, lab to certify that what the stones are and the quality of the stones, the size of the stones, carat weight and so on. Uh, because without that, the stone could be and is often found to be uh, a fake. So uh, jewelry should come with, uh, good jewelry should come with certifications from the GIA. You've probably read a lot about title in the, in the, in the uh, in the press, restitution cases from works of art that were stolen during World War II and other issues. It, the, the Modigliani on the left is a good case. Uh, it was owned by a man called Stettiner in Europe before the war. It was taken by the Nazis in 1944, sold at Christie's 
for $3.2 million in 1966 before these restitution cases were really becoming uh, to the forefront, re-offered at Sotheby's in 2008, by which time the family had realized that this was their piece. There was a restitution claim. The piece was withdrawn from the market. So there are names like Hans Venland, Hans Frankhauser, you can see the names here, Fisher Auctioneers, Bruno Loza, Semmel, Muller Auction House. Those names raise huge red flags to us when we see them in the provenance of a work of art. Those were all people that were selling works that were looted by the, lot, by the Nazis. Uh, there is something now called title insurance, which clients can buy in order to protect themselves. It doesn't mean that the work of art has clear title, but it does mean if there's a title, um, uh, if there is an issue with the title, that the client will get fully reimbursed for the work of art if they have title insurance. On the right-hand side, a totally different issue, which we find happens very often, it's the empty hook syndrome. And that is, uh, I'll give you a, a case study here. We had a woman who came to us and said, um, I need a value on this painting, um, the painting that you see there. She, and so our, my colleague said, well, where did you get it? Had to either have been purchased, in which case you have a receipt for it, or it came through an estate and you have an estate appraisal for it, or it was a gift and you have some paperwork on it. And she said, no. What happened was her mother had told her when her mother died to take the painting off the wall and not declare it in the, in the estate tax. After, after, you know, who pays estate taxes? You know, what dummies pay estate taxes? She took the painting and she knew, she recognized it was probably the thing of most value in her mother's estate, held it for about a month and decided to sell it. She knew she shouldn't go to auction because it was such a, uh, uh, an issue. So she sold it to the local dealer near her who offered her $400,000. She was thrilled. And she said that reinforces the idea of who are those dummies who paid taxes. Mm -hmm. She put the money in her account, and around, around April the next year, her, her accountant said to her, everything looks in order, except where did you get this $400,000? And she said, well, I took something off my mother's wall, I sold it, and uh, he said, right, we have to reopen the estate. So that, at that point, she came to us and said, what's it worth? We did some searching uh, and found out that the dealer who had purchased it from her had flipped it and sold it at auction for $875,000 about three months later. So what do you think the IRS valued it at? $875,000. What did she have to do? She paid half that in tax. There goes her $400,000 and more. And she paid huge penalties and barely escaped going to prison. So the reason I tell you that story is for so many reasons. Uh, this happens all the time. People take things and they think it's fine, but title never passes. Until that reappraisal had been done, the reason, by the way, the reason why we use this story is that she didn't like the news that we gave her about $875,000. She didn't pay our bill, so she goes into our PowerPoint presentations as a, <laughs> <laughs> as a cautionary tale. But, <laughs> but in any case, in, in, in terms of title, you know, when she, when she took it from her mother's estate, title didn't pass from the estate to her. When she sold it to the dealer, no title transfer. Dealer sold it through the auction house to a new person, no title transfer. That new person never had title of this until the case was reopened, the, the appraisal was prepared, the penalties were paid. Then, like dominoes, it all fell into, into place. But title is important. You know, There's no statute of limitation on tax fraud. And um, she was lucky to get away with it as she did. These days, with the contemporary art that we see, there are, uh, you know, not only do we see old master paintings and damaged and so on, but the condition issues that arise from contemporary art, like this formaldehyde shark, are so different from anything we've ever seen before. I think many of you know about this shark. It was, is owned by a, 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 an ex-hedge fund manager from Greenwich, Connecticut. I think you can guess which one. And uh, it started to decay because the artist had not mixed, the artist or his studio had not mis mixed the formaldehyde properly. So luckily for this collector, the artist said he would replace the shark. And he gave him a new shark in new formaldehyde. And the funny thing is that the old shark was a very vicious looking shark, but people say this shark is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, on the right hand side, back to the Dan Flavin piece that I talked to you about before with authenticity. Uh, the problem with, with a lot of contemporary art, it's made out of materials that are degrading or that no longer exist, like these fluorescent tubes that Dan Flavin used in his 
artworks. They're not made anymore. So as, they, as these things burn out, it's very hard to replace them with new uh, light kind um, uh, tubes, fluorescent tubes. It's a big condition issue. Fakes and forgeries, as the market, as you can imagine, as the market goes up in value in all these different areas, the, the forgeries flood into the market. There was a big case of Nodler that I mentioned before, uh, the oldest gallery in the U.S., a fantastic gallery. You know, it used to be when we'd see a Nodler sticker on the back of a painting, we didn't even ask any more questions. It was such a good provenance to have. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you have read in the paper that uh, Nodler was responsible for channeling about $80 million of forged art through their system. And there are huge law cases ongoing with this still. Uh, it's ruined a lot of careers. Uh, it's a real shame, but people didn't do the right due diligence. You can't look at a label on the back of a picture now and accept that the picture is right. You have to look at that provenance you have to look at uh, the title transfer, uh, you have to look at condition and so on, but you really have to see where that piece has been before and, it, and assure yourself by using experts that the work is authentic. Uh, I've, I've noted for you some other famous forgers, they're fantastic to read about, there are lots of books on forgery that are really pretty spectacular. These days uh, Fabergé is forged, um, my husband is a Fabergé specialist of the 100 pieces he sees, about 95 are forgeries these days. He went down to look at a collection not so long ago in, in Texas. Uh, the family had, over the course of a number of years, had continued to buy from the same dealer every year. They had spent $15 million. They had had the dealer do the appraisal each year and amazingly it kept going up in value. Their insurance company called us. They were a little concerned because the value was so high compared to the net worth of the clients. And 95% uh, of it was forged. So they had more than 95%. They had about $200,000 worth of Fabergé and they'd spent over $15 million. So again, you know, it's not such a smart idea to have the person that you, the dealer that you've bought something from do the appraisal. You should really get, get another appraisal. and talking about who pays taxes. Uh, many clients don't realize that there are use taxes. So clients think, fine, I can buy something in New York, ship it to my house in Connecticut, and I'm done. I haven't, all I pay for is the shipping. No other taxes are due. Use taxes are that hidden tax that uh, it's up to the, the individual to declare on your tax return. Super important. Um, Kozlowski was put into jail for uh, tax fraud and uh, paid huge fines when he didn't pay his taxes on buying the works of art that he bought. Uh, you pay not only tax but also penalties and all sorts of things. But use tax is, is important. It's something that clients should realize is crucial to pay. The states are not forgiving when they find a use tax fraud. There is a new scheme you probably read about in the New York Times recently that is legal, but I'm not sure for how long it will be, that if you live in, in uh, California, you can buy something outside the state, ship it to Oregon or two other states for a period of six months or so, uh, and then ship it back into ca uh, California and pay no, ta no tax, no use tax, no um, uh, sales tax. It's an extraordinary little loophole there, which I'm sure they're going to close very shortly. and opportunities. So with all this increase in value for art, art becomes an asset. It's not just something beautiful to look at or to sit on. It becomes something that clients can actually use as a tool. Uh, those are the two. I talked about fair market value and retail replacement value before. There's a third level of value. That's marketable cash value. That's what the banks are asking us for when clients want to use art as collateral. And what they're doing with the art is they use the art as collateral they get a very low interest rate loan and they reinvest that in their hedge fund, in new art, in business, in whatever they want to, but you can generally make more money by investing that low interest um, loan in some other area of the market. So they're using their art now, they're using it as an asset to make money or to, uh, to, to do other things with it. So marketable cash value is fair market value, it's that auction value minus the cost of sales. So minus insurance, minus commissions, minus fees, like shipping and so on, 
It's that net net that the client gets after they sell something uh, at auction. The banks use that number, take half of that generally, and give that amount to the client based on the fair market value of their art. There are asset-based lenders uh, that loan against art, and there are banks that loan against art but using other collateral as well as security. So that's a great opportunity for clients who, instead of seeing their art sit on the wall and go up in value over years, they can actually use it uh, to, make, to make additional funds for themselves. And the other big issue now is 1031 exchanges. That's something that started in the real, real estate business. It's exchanging like kind for like kind. So you are deferring tax. If you have a work of art that is worth, you bought it at a million dollars. Now it's worth $10 million. Uh, say it's a Picasso. You can exchange that Picasso for a like kind work or works of art, meaning something that's in the same uh, medium, usually in the same age bracket. You can exchange them. So your $10 million Picasso now becomes, say, two, 10 million, two works of art valued at $10 million. You've just raised your base level up to $10 million. So if you sell it at $10 million, then your, base, your basis is 10. You're not paying that capital gains. If you had taken that $1 million work of art, Picasso, had sold it when it became $10 million, you'd pay capital gains on that $9 million difference. So this is something people are doing a lot of. As the market increases, as I said, at an exponential rate for certain categories of art, it makes a lot of sense. However, you can't be just a collector and you can't be a dealer to do a like-kind exchange. You have to be what they call an investor collector. So it's, there are very strict parameters for doing 1031 exchanges, not that difficult to maneuver, but there's not a whole lot of case law on it yet, and so people who are doing it have to be pretty cautious uh, and, and follow all the rules as they see them now. Yeah? Is the like-kind um to like an oil painting, where oil painting, or could you take an oil painting for a townhouse or something like that? No. Just oil painting, oil painting, oil for oil. Okay. Oil for oil uh, has to be within the United States. It can't be an oil here for an oil in Canada. Um, there are lots of rules and regulations. Again, the case law is pretty thin. So is that tightened up? No. Over the years? It it's hasn't. Just, no, it's something that's just started really in the last five or five or eight well, years. I'm just so familiar with it from the real estate standpoint That's right. that I'm just... Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a great new opportunity. And there you have it. It gives you an overview of the art market today. I'd love to take some questions, if there are any. Yes? You see the uh, capital gain, the 28% collectible rate, is there any pressure to change that? You think it's just going to live on? I think it's actually now 32. Oh, it's up to 32? Yes, yeah. Oh my it's, gosh. it's higher than, than any other asset. It'll, it'll, did, I don't did, think it will change. When did that change? So it's been that way for, for a while. Oh, yeah. Yes. On that same thing, you mentioned earlier about the definition, so to speak, in the vernacular of what is a collectible. It's expanding and expanding and then <coughs> With the 32% in line, is the IRS expanding that also? And you know, if you have things that you know, matchbox covers or something. You know, how extensive is this becoming in terms of uh, tax exposure? Well, the IRS, it's the states are looking at everything that's under about fifty thousand dollars now. The, it used to be twenty thousand dollars. The states would look at anything individually over twenty thousand would go to the IRS. Now it's they pushed up that level because as the market increases, it would just be impossible for them to cope with that. So they're doing things sort of fifty or even a hundred thousand and above okay. in Washington. But they are beefing up their team. They are hiring experts, not in the art, uh, in the in the particularly in the art area. So they have an expert in. in Chinese works of art, they have an expert in uh, prints and paintings and so on. They really are looking at it very closely because it's something that they can uh, find a lot of fraud in. So cars and watches, yep. jewelry, mm -hmm. that threshold is similar? Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Questions. First, what's the level of interest in Japanese art? 
Second, very different. Uh, where would you go if you were trying to sell old photographs of Native Americans? Where is the center for that? Is that the West? No, old photographs, there are a couple of good places. Swan in New York is good, good for photographs. Um, they're probably the best in that area. Uh, you can sometimes use Christie's and Sotheby's for the um, photographs. Native American, oh, there are a lot of places you can sell that. Bonham sells that, Christie's and Sotheby's sell it. There are some places out in the, in the West, um, local auction houses in the West that sell that. Bonham's out in California sells that. Um, Yes. As you had mentioned, there's no statute of limitations on tax fraud. How about with individuals? I, mean, I know that a thief can't give good title, but what if someone finds something in their attic and say it's been there for 50 years or so, and they, I mean, isn't there some, isn't there some kind of a cutoff point somewhere for, for length of time that someone can have something and it won't be challenged after that? No, that's a good question. Any lawyers in here that can answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you, if you prove that it's been in your family for a long time, that's fine. Uh, in, in, in legal terms, if you buy something, say at auction, I think it's a seven year, someone can correct, correct me, but I think it's seven years. It's a con I think it would probably be the contract statute of limitations. Right. Right. It also should be some bona fide purchaser concept in, in, um, in art, but I, this is just not my area, so right. I don't know the answer to that. It's a really good question. It is a good question. It, with restitution cases, it's from the time that you actually realize that something's been stolen, I think it's another eight years or something like that. So I think it's different for different areas of the market. But there are, I guess, special exceptions, as you mentioned, Nazi. I mean, that, yes. they've made special laws for that, but I'm just thinking about uh, art in general. In general? I, yeah, it's a good question. I need a lawyer to answer that one. Similar to that question, I was wondering, the woman with the $400,000 painting, yeah. if her mother had given it to her 10 years before and she'd had it all along, how, how differently would things have been? Completely different. Her mother would have had to have had an appraisal to transfer title to her daughter uh, because it's over the level. If anything under 5000 you don't have to have that written appraisal, but you do have to fill out forms. Anything 5000 or above, you need to have an appraisal. So she would pay gift tax. Yeah. The IRS likes to get it one way or the other. But they can give it. They can give 13 grand or whatever, 26 grand a year. So if it was under that, yes, it would have been fine. And yes. but you still would have had to have done uh, an appraisal. An appraisal. So if if the mother was clueless and didn't realize it was five thousand dollars or more, what happens? Well, I think the burden of proof is on the owner. You can't just assume something and, and not do anything about it. I think the IRS is going to look at that pretty closely. But if it's been in the family den for 50 years and, oh, no, if you like this, please take it. No, there are rules. There are okay. laws. <laughs> I, think that, I think there's a diff there's two different things. One is the transfer from either the mother or the estate to the, to the person, to the daughter. And the other would be a sale by the daughter. Because I think the daughter would get a basis step up, right? That's when right. the mother died, yeah, the basis true. would okay. step up to fair value at the point, at the time of death. So if the daughter sold it, she wouldn't have that capital gain issue. But you still can't transfer. The, the IRS is going to look at the value, okay. right? And whether it's a current transfer or a transfer in connection with an estate. Exactly. Okay. Yes? Yeah, along with that $400,000 painting, um, the, the, the estate exclusion was like $10 million last year. Uh, and before that, it was, um, you know, a graduated amount less, so it was in millions of dollars. So unless that is, you know, if that was the most valuable thing on a mother's wall, uh, and the state wasn't that big, then the the uh, the federal tax should have had a, uh, an, an exclusion that 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 four hundred thousand dollars would be less than than there would be state tax involved, but not the state tax involved, but not IRS. Who knows? And who knows what the IRS pursues. In the connection, in connection with an audit, I mean, if they were auditing the estate, they were auditing the estate. So, uh, you know, and, and their f taxes and their fees and penalties associated. So, I, I don't know. As I say, I'm not, I, I don't do estate taxes. So, <laughs> well, I'm just guessing here. Yes. To establish title, does someone has an artwork, and let's just say they're in their 90s and they want to give it to you as a gift, 
um, has the Adele Milan family members. How did you go about establishing this type of getting two independent appraisals and then doing like birth records or because it wasn't a sale, it was given to the person. They worked for the person that gifted it to them. So how would they go about establishing titles so that the person that they lead it to won't have to have this heavy burden? That's a good question. You should have some kind of paperwork. If something's gifted to you, maybe a little letter saying, I gifted this to so-and-so on such a date. Something that, that formalizes that gift. It's always smart to do. Because you mentioned like the safe deposit boxes. Um, someone I know has a safety deposit box, but we're having difficulties matching what goes with what because of the language. Would that be something that we run an appraisal in on to? Yeah, know? sure, you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. If it's say jewelry or something to match the jewelry with the listing that you have, or paint. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you were talking about lending against art as mm -hmm. collateral. And given the given that the that the art market is changing so radically, and and you're reassessing, uh, reappraising things every six months, do the lenders reappraise the collateral on a on a regular basis? Every and if year, it's, if they're undersecured, do they ask for additional collateral? Exactly that. Yes. Uh, every year that this have to be examined in person. Uh, every six months if they get nervous, but usually every year. Uh, we know condition for any changes. We make sure everything's there, that something hasn't been sold. If the market's going down, they have to put additional collateral in in order to support their loans. So, and that's annual, annually? Annually, yes. yes. You know, from, <coughs> from time to time, <coughs> excuse me, we get a call from somebody who wants to donate something to the college. You know, recently I got uh, somebody who called uh, to give us a print of a Watanabe, you know, a Japanese uh, woodcut artist. And when that person came to us said, uh, this is worth $10,000. And can I say to them, look, you have to bear the cost of the appraisal? Um, because what happened in that particular case was as I was put it off in the side of my office, and my administrative assistant during a lunch break went on the internet to see if there's another one that's being sold just like that. And sure enough, there was one for 1500 bucks right. that was being sold. <laughs> so I didn't want to spend, you know, several hundred dollars getting it appraised. And, and, and then, you, you see the point, is, is, it, is it okay for me to say to them? Of course, you may not get it as a, as a gift. <laughs> but see, if it was ten thousand dollars, I don't mind spending a few hundred dollars and getting it appraised. But if it's only worth five hundred dollars, then I don't want to spend it. I would say if you found that on the internet, be cautious. Because Is that good enough? Uh, well, it depends on what the source was, where it was being sold. <laughs> if it's eBay, I don't know, not so sure. But if it's a reputable dealer who's selling it for that amount or an auction result, you can. Yeah, pretty much bet on that. Yes? Yeah. Uh, this might be a simplex question, but you mentioned use tax compared to sales tax. Right. What exa what's the definition of use tax? You go to the uh, grocery store, you pay your, you get, are there, are there, is, there, is there sales tax on groceries? I can't even yes. remember. But anyway, you go to the grocery store, you pay for your groceries, and you pay tax. That's sales tax. Uh, but if you buy a work of art, in New York and you ship it to Connecticut, New York does not charge you sales tax, but Connecticut insists on you paying use tax. But it's not, they don't come to your door and say you, pay, you owe use tax. It's something you as a, an individual have to report on your taxes. I bought something in New York, it's worth a million dollars, I need to pay Connecticut tax on it. Do so people pay it? People don't pay it. <laughs> people don't pay it or they don't know it even exists, most yeah. people. Yeah. It's the, the use tax is the same rate as the sales tax, right? Well, the use tax is in the state in which you're... I, I understand, but I mean, in, in Connecticut, the, the use tax would be the same rate as the sales tax. I believe it is. I believe it is. But uh, I guess the only way to get caught is if there has to be some kind of a registration. Because if you buy a car in New Hampshire, you don't pay a sales tax. They don't have a sales tax in New Hampshire. But if they register in New York, then they catch for the use tax. It's like that. So as you say, there are probably a lot of... Uh, of evasion because people just think they're getting a gain by putting it to another state, but they uh, really owe it, but it never gets collected. That's right. Uh, and, unless there's something like this that catches up with them. With 
we are. That's correct. And most people, as I say, don't even realize that there is a use tax. Yeah. yeah. Is there a, um, an institution that provides a service that behaves as a repository for titles, certifications, to protect the integrity of art? There is something called, there are two companies, one called the Art Loss Register uh, that has been around for quite a long time. It's the biggest and best known uh, repository of information concerning title and, and stolen works of art and so on. So yes, Art Loss Register, and there's can, a new one that just can, started. Can ownership be transferred within the institution and that title be retained there? No, the title's not retained there, just the information is retained there. Just the information. Yes. So what you're saying is that the information is there, but the physical title isn't. Right. The physical title I'm stays is, is there like a data bank somewhere that says, I'm going to start scanning titles? Hmm. Never heard of so it. So that... The county clerk office is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Not for what Because paper could be burned, but if it's in the electronic form, it could be oh. stored and transferred. Why don't you start the business? It's a really good business. <laughs> <laughs> but that same um, group that you just mentioned, the Art Loss Register, yeah, they will, if you want, they will scan in your whole collection and they know it's yours so that if three options down the road they happen to see your painting, they'll call you and say, oh, do you have this up for option? But it's not the same thing as the county clerk keeping track of title. It right. goes back to that, that uh, Wall Street Journal. Statement, largest legal economy to be largely unregulated. That's the art market. Yes. What's your opinion of buying artworks on a cruise? <laughs> <laughs> First question to you: Have you bought an artwork on a cruise? No. <laughs> Has anybody here bought an artwork on a cruise? It's not usually a good idea. The, 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 the prices are very high, and there was a big scandal not too long ago with uh, dollies that were being sold that were fake uh, on board one of the cruise lines. So you know, it's like buying at an art fair. The prices are inflated in certain situations. If you can bargain, then it may be worth it. But uh, normally I'd say don't buy on a cruise. You know? <laughs> Enjoy the cruise, don't buy art. <laughs> yes? You talked about forgeries. It would seem to me that the forgeries are only of art that's not that well known. In other words, if you uh, had a forged Rembrandt, I mean, people, you, you, I mean, it'd be in some museum and you'd know that it wasn't right when you're buying. So is that the way it works or is people just not check it out and they think they get a big deal and actually it's hanging in some museum somewhere and they actually bought a forgery. But isn't, wouldn't it be limited more to art that's not very well known so you, you couldn't tell if there was another original piece out there? You know, it wouldn't be a Rembrandt, uh, but it, would, it could be um, any other artist basically because even though they're catalog resumes for the artists, the forgers are really clever and they fill gaps. They'll take something, make up a provenance, and make it look like something that fit into a certain time period in artist's work. Uh, so, you know, the forgers have forged Matisse and Picasso and, and on and on and on. All the great names of uh, the great masters of uh, the art world have been forged. So this is a new piece, though. It's a piece that, I mean, that no one's heard of, right? I mean, right. This, yeah. mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Rothko. Yes. A theory as to why contemporary art is uh, so important now, and where do you see things headed? Do you see it a shift occurring, or is this the way it's going to be for a long time? I think this is the way it's going to be. You know, as the great impressionist and modern works are all bought by uh, institutions and they're off the market, there just isn't the supply. Uh, also, I think contemporary art is easier in some sense to uh, to live with because you don't have to be very scholarly to live with the Jeff Koons or, um, or, or some of the other art, contemporary art. They, they're easy to look at, they're fun to have in your house, <coughs> don't require a lot of scholarship. Um, so it's a big, broad, deep market. I think it's <coughs> just going to continue to increase. People are a little worried right now with the situation in, uh, in the Ukraine and Russia and so on. What's that going to do to the Russian buyers? Is it going to change the dynamics of the art market? I don't think so. It's a very broad and deep market now. We have lots of buyers from Asia coming in to buy Western art. Uh, Brazilians, um, Russians still a lot of Russian buying. Lots of Middle East buying, lots of American buying, lots of European buying. It's a very strong market. 
Is that globalization one of the reasons why it's hard to regulate? And is the regulation coming more from within your groups, the foundations, the appraisal foundations, self-regulating or from the government? It's definitely self-regulating. The government's now looking at the appraisal foundation to help provide that, those parameters, but it's really a self-regulated industry. Globalization helps in one sense because information moves much more quickly. So uh, scams come to the surface much faster. Information's out there about what something was sold for in the past. Uh, so globalization helps in the one sense it broadens the market, it deepens the market. Any more questions? Elizabeth, I thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you.